Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to today's AHRQ web conference on assessing safety risks associated with electronic health records. Although a few people are still logging in, we are going to go ahead and get started on time. My name is Ed Lomaton, and I will be moderating this webinar. I currently serve as a medical officer and chief of clinical informatics in the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement in the Division of Health IT at ARC. This slide shows the agenda for today's webinar. Please also note that we are recording this webinar, and the recording will be available via the ARC Health IT YouTube channel in about two weeks. Copies of the PowerPoint slides were emailed to each of you earlier this morning, and were also available for download as you logged in today. We will also be sending them to participants via email following the webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to take a moment to remind everyone about why ARC sponsors these webinars and how this work is related to ARC's mission. As a research agency within the Department of Health and Human Services, ARC's mission is to produce evidence to make healthcare safer, higher quality, more accessible, equitable, and affordable, and to work with others in HHS and with other partners to make sure that the evidence is understood and used. ARC works to accomplish this mission through a diverse body of work carried out by its research portfolios and offices. This work includes investing in research, generating materials, and providing training opportunities such as this webinar that can help to foster diffusion of research findings to the agency's key stakeholder groups and to the public. The health IT portfolio at ARC has a long history of supporting research that seeks to answer some of the fundamental health IT questions in the field. ARC is currently funding research demonstration and dissemination projects in clinical decision support, including those for the scale of existing clinical decision support for patient-centered outcomes research findings and to develop new clinical decision support based on patient-centered outcomes research findings. We are also actively seeking R03, R21, R18, and R01 applications in two areas for which we have published special emphasis notices. One is to study the design, implementation, usability, and safe use of health IT, and another to study the use of health IT for patient-reported outcomes and patient contextual data to improve quality. Today's presentations will focus on research funded by HRQ on the safe use of electronic health record systems, specifically methods to evaluate the safety of computerized provider order entry functionality. We are pleased to have with us today an esteemed group of presenters. They include Dr. David Klassen, Chief Medical Information Officer for Pascal Metrics and Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Utah, and Dr. Jason Edelman, Chief Patient Safety Officer and Associate Chief Quality Officer at Columbia University, who will present on his research section second. This webinar event is accredited by Professional Education Services Group, and for those of you who are interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, Information about how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of the presentations. It will also be emailed to you after this webinar. For the purposes of accreditation, let me note that neither ARC, AFYA, RTI, PESG, Dr. Edelman, nor myself have any financial interests to disclose. Dr. Klassen would like to disclose that he is an employee and stockholder of Pascal Metrics and is consultant to Mentis, Philips, and Health Catalyst. Lastly, please note that no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. Just a brief note about questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentations to address participant questions. However, during the presentations, feel free to submit questions that you have for the presenters using the Q&A panel located on the right of the PowerPoint slides. As a reminder, participants are in a listen-only mode, so to ask questions, you will need to use the Q&A panel. This slide shows the learning objectives for today's webinar. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to, one, discuss the use of a computerized provider order entry evaluation tool to self-assess an, in an inpatient EHR system for safety performance and plan refinements that aim to improve the tool, and two, describe the potential risk of providers placing orders in the wrong patient's record when multiple patient records are open at once in an electronic health record system. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. David Klassen. 
As noted earlier, Dr. Klassen is the Chief Medical Informatics Officer at Pascal Metrics, a patient safety organization and an Associate Professor of Medicine at the University of Utah and an active consultant in infectious diseases at the University of Utah School of Medicine in Salt Lake City, Utah. He received his medical degree from the University of Virginia School of Medicine and a Master's of Science degree in Medical Informatics from the University of Utah School of Medicine. He was a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee that developed the National Healthcare Quality Report. And he was also a member of the IOM Committee on Patient Safety and Data Standards. He was recently a member of the IOM Committee on Health Information Technology and Patient Safety. And now it is my pleasure to turn the control over to Dr. Klassen. Great. Thanks very much, Ed, and welcome, everybody. Um, and um, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be talking about an ARC-funded project uh, to develop methods to evaluate the safety of your operational EHR system. And this project is continuing work that ARC has funded for more than 10 years on a tool that's commonly known as the LeapFrog CPOE tool. Um, and that tool, which has been publicly available since 2008, is now getting an upgrade um, with funding from ARC, and we'll be talking about what we've learned with that tool to date and where we're going in the future. If we can move to the next slide, please. Um, today we'll uh, talk uh, about safety in EHRs in general. Then we'll talk a little bit about the tool and what we have learned and where we're headed and what we hope to learn. Uh, and then uh, we'll share some of the lessons learned uh, with the use of this tool um, and make, uh, uh, hopefully, a plea for uh, many of you to continue to use this tool. Um, this year, um, more than 1,400 hospitals in the United States have used this tool. Um, so uh, we know people are using it. We hope as we upgrade it, more people will use it. Next slide, please. Um, we know that uh, healthcare IT uh, clearly appears to improve safety overall. Um, there are many studies uh, showing its benefit. However, recently, I think over the last five to eight years, we've seen more and more studies that suggest that uh, there's another side of the coin to health IT, and it may actually uh, provide new risks uh, to patients uh, and the safety of care as well. And a whole IOM committee report was written about this, uh, published in 2011, the uh, Health IT and Safety Report. Um, and it outlined, I think, uh, that the impact of uh, health IT on harm and patient safety is not exactly certain. Indeed, it's uncertain. And part of that is the heterogeneous nature of health IT. Part of it is uh, the diverse clinical environments and workflow that IT is implemented in. Um, and part of it is the limited uh, evidence in the literature. Um, the FDA clearly has authority to regulate health IT, but has not really done so, except in very limited ways related to medical devices to date. Uh, but there have been calls for uh, the FDA to get into this area. Next slide, please. Clearly, the literature is full of potential problems associated with health IT. Um, one study showed an increase in mortality at a children's hospital when an EMR with CPOE application was introduced. Uh, the use of the LeapFrog tool to study CPOE uh, across 63 hospitals with EHRs uh, found problems with the implementation of uh, uh, decision support and CPOE in EHRs. Indeed, in, in the tool itself, 53% of medication orders that would have been failed would have been fatal or not detected by the 63 hospitals that were taking the test. Um, clearly, there are problems of providers writing electronic orders on the wrong patient. Uh, Jason's going to talk about that in his session. And indeed, there have been other problems. Um, uh, for example, a sensor attached to an asthma rescue inhaler recorded the location where the rescue medication is used, but not the time when that information was uploaded to the MR, uh, the time of the upload, not the time the medication use was recorded. Um, so there clearly are problems with uh, these uh, complex systems, and unfortunately, uh, there really is no good generally agreed upon place to report them or a overall conventional uh, nomenclature classification on how to report these problems. So uh, we hear about them, but we don't have a good handle on how common they are. Next slide. Uh, one of the most prominent studies in this area was a study uh, done by uh, Ross Capel um, and published in 2000 and 
2005 that evaluated CPOE commercial application at the University of Pennsylvania and asked users about their impressions of the system. And what they found is that there were many situations in which this leading ES CPOE system facilitated medication error risk. It often took many screens to uh, do things, and uh, very often needed views were not available. And many others have made observations, not only about this system, but about other systems as well. Hardeep Singh, Joan Ash, and Dean Siddig have also reported uh, extensively on uh, these challenges. Next slide, please. Certainly with respect to the COPPL study, there were some limitations of that study. It didn't count errors or adverse events. And the CPOE application and study was an old one. Nevertheless, the paper stimulated really valuable debate about the safety of these systems when they're actually running in operation. And I think it outlined how important it is for us to think not only about the software on the shelf, but the software after uh, implementation. And that we have probably a great need to focus more and more uh, uh, emphasis uh, on what these systems look like in actual operation. And indeed, that's the purpose of uh, uh, this safe EHR test and program. Next slide, please. Clearly, the FDA uh, has a potential role in this area, and uh, FIDESIA was a task force put together of the FDA, FDA, ONC, and FTC, and they made a number of recommendations about what the FDA should do in this area, and they basically said that uh, the FDA should not regulate this area with a couple exceptions as listed here, uh, but they also said that a new risk framework should be developed if there is any oversight of this area. And that was also a recommendation in the IOM report on health IT and safety. The idea being that EHRs are very different than medical devices and that any oversight of them probably needs a, a new framework. And indeed, the FIDESIA report started the description of what that new risk-based framework would look like. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk about a project called the Safe uh, EHRs Project. This is an ARC-funded project at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in the University of Utah to take the leapfrog test in its current format and update it, uh, both from content, new capabilities, and uh, reinvent the technology platform that it's on. So we're going to talk for the rest of the talk about this work. Uh, next slide, please. And actually, ARC funded uh, development of this tool more than 10 years ago, along with Robert Wood Johnson and uh, the California Healthcare Foundation. And uh, originally, uh, uh, there were several of us involved in uh, creating this tool, David Bates and myself, Peter Kil Kilbridge, Emily Wallabob, and Jane Metzger. And we also had the invaluable help of the Institute for Safe Medication uh, Practices. Mike Cohen, Alan Veda, and now uh, Matt Grissinger have been enormously helpful to us in uh, building this tool um, and, and continue to be. So uh, kudos to them for all that they've done. We did a lot of testing of this tool initially back then, uh, iterator reliability and other things. And then finally, the tool was released on the LeapFrog uh, website through its annual survey in 2008 and has been used there continuously since. Uh, we updated some of aspects of the test in 2011. And in this year, more than 1,400 hospitals in the United States uh, have uh, actually used the tool. Uh, uh, so uh, it's broadly used uh, by many organizations. Next slide. Uh, the question is, if a hospital does well on this test or does poorly on this test, does that have any real meaning in terms of the hospital's performance? Uh, in this area, which is the occurrence of adverse drug events. And in a study published in 2013, uh, David Bates and colleagues uh, evaluated this. And they looked at hospitals that have both taken the test and had a rigorous research program to track their adverse drug events. And what they found is there was a direct correlation between how hospitals did on this test and their overall rate of adverse drug events. Indeed, there was a 43% relative reduction of adverse drug events for every 5% increase in the leapfrog score. There were four fewer preventable adverse drug events per 100 missions for every 5% increase in the score. So there clearly is a relationship between how hospitals do on this test and their uh, overall rate of adverse drug events. Next slide, please. So we're going to talk a lot about this tool that's been available since 2008. It's a web-based self-assessment tool uh, that hospitals can use through the LeapFrog survey. Uh, it takes about four to six hours to complete, um, and um, it includes download instructions, test patient profiles, orders, and observation sheets, 
uh, all of this is entered into the operational CPOE EHR system, and it records what happens when uh, these uh, scenarios are entered into the system. And then it gives immediate feedback on a hospital's overall uh, uh, score as well as individual domain scores. Uh, and we'll show you what those are. Next slide, please. So basically, the logistics of, uh, of how this web-enabled self-assessment tool works for hospitals is hospitals get uh, a password through the LeapFrog uh, survey, uh, and they answer a couple questions about their CPOE, EHR, and third-party databases. Um, and once they do all that, they get permission to take the test. They log on and get a series of simulated patient cases. Um, and they enter them into their system, and then they uh, go back to the website and download a series of orders related to those simulated patient scenarios. They enter them into their system. They record the results of what happens. They're given an overall score um, uh, in the test and a score in a variety of categories, and then um, uh, the, uh, they get um, the availability of individual scores uh, for their hospital, an overall score is sent to LeapFrog. Uh, that's the way the test currently works. And it will be very similar as we update the test uh, uh, and deliver that uh, for uh, LeapFrog survey next year. Next slide. So the test is built around um, simulated scenarios uh, that are unsafe. And virtually all the scenarios in this test are actual real-world scenarios that have harmed patients. And we've had access to a series of databases that keep track of patient harm and take, trace it all the way back into the EHR to a patient order. So uh, the scenarios in this test actually happened somewhere, and they actually caused harm to someone. So to be a scenario in this test, it's not enough just to cause an error. You must have some evidence that uh, this has gone all the way to the patient and called patient harm. So here's an example of one of these scenarios, uh, an actual patient, a female who was 52 years old. She weighed 60 kilograms. She was allergic to morphine. Uh, she had a normal creatinine. She was in the hospital, and um, she had been on Coumadin prior to entering the hospital, and someone ordered uh, Coumadin 5 milligrams three times a day. Uh, and that order went through the system and the patient got harmed. Uh, and so this is an example of the type of scenarios we use uh, in this test, uh, real-world, actual scenarios. Next slide. So as organizations take this test, they download a series of these uh, real-world scenarios, usually anywhere from 10 to 12, um, and they're kept pretty simple. Um, and we ask the hospitals to enter these scenarios into their operational system, um, and um, we give them about four hours to do that. Uh, next slide. And then after they've successfully done that, we give the hospitals a series of orders to go along with these patient scenarios and ask them to enter that into their system, their operational system, and then we see what happens when these orders are entered to the appropriate uh, patient scenario on the prior slide, whether the system generated any uh, alerts or information or blocked it, or whether the order was accepted uh, uh, without any problems, or whether the order, uh, the medication couldn't be ordered because it's just not available electronically uh, in their system. Um, and so hospitals, therefore, place these orders in, and then they come back to the website and respond uh, for each of the individual orders um, what their system did when they placed them uh, within, the, uh, within uh, their system. Next slide, please. So after the hospitals feed back uh, the 50-some orders that they entered in their system, they get evaluated on the hospital's performance in all these different categories and they get a score reflecting how many of these unsafe scenarios in each of the categories did they correctly pick up. In addition, the hospitals get a score from LeapFrog that's based on how many uh, categories they scored more than 50% in, um, and uh, the, the routine of that is uh, 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 a series of moons. And the only thing that goes back to LeapFrog is the moons. The hospitals are the only ones that see uh, their individual performance in categories. Next slide, please. And the categories, uh, as they're currently envisioned, are broken out uh, by these. Uh, therapeutic duplication, how good does your operational system pick up uh, ordering, for instance, Tylenol um, uh, 
uh, and uh, Tylenol uh, number three with codeine, if you will, or codeine number three, uh, it's looking for therapeutic duplication where we're uh, ordering the same medication, if you will, uh, on the same patient, either directly or through compounded medications. It turns out this is a common cause of harm across the country. Another category is drug dose. Uh, uh, can your system pick up an excessive single drug dose? Another is drug dose daily. So can your system pick up um, uh, not an overdose on a single dose, but an overdose in a daily dose? Um, and then another category is drug allergies. Can the operational system pick up important drug allergies or drug cost allergies? Drug route. Can the system pick up the wrong route, for instance, ordering Tylenol intravenously? Drug-drug interactions. Can the system pick up the uh, most common and serious drug-drug interactions? Drug diagnosis, can the system pick up ordering, for instance, um, a beta blocker in a patient with asthma, or can it pick up ordering a drug that would harm a fetus in a pregnant woman? Drug age, can the patient, can the system pick up uh, a dose that really should be uh, either not used in a patient of a certain age or adjusted for a patient of a certain age? Uh, drug renal, can the system pick up a patient who's in renal failure and is having a drug order that needs to be dose adjusted for their renal? function. Um, drug lab, can the uh, system pick up uh, uh, drugs that should be not ordered or, or orders should be changed when there are certain abnorm abnormal laboratory tests? Monitoring, um, does the system uh, uh, adequately say if we uh, order amiodarone that we need to order a level for amiodarone? And then nuisance, uh, does the system um, uh, over alert on things that shouldn't be alerted on, and then finally deception, just our way for testing, for testing irregularities. Next slide. So uh, when the first test was first released in uh, 2008, uh, we uh, studied aggressively uh, hospitals that took the test that first year, and uh, we eventually found a sample of 62 hospitals that uh, took the test, and we decided to study them intensively and how they did on the test. Um, and what we found is that the hospitals as a group, 63 of them, had enormous variation in how they did on the test. They picked up as many as 82% of these unsafe scenarios or as few as 10%, so enormous variability. And built into the test are a series of fatal orders, orders that would routinely kill someone if they were administered. And what was most stunning uh, in this evaluation uh, in 2008 was only 53% of all the fatal medication orders were picked up by these hospitals with their implemented uh, EHR systems with CPOE and decision support. So that was of great concern. Next slide. And if we look at the results from this study in more detail, and we take those 63 hospitals and we put them vertically in similar vendor groups, so uh, each vertical line represents one vendor and a group of hospitals who took the test within that vendor group. Um, and as you can see, we found enormous variability within the same vendor group. So hospitals that had vendor two, if you will, had enormous variability. Hospitals that had vendor four had enormous variability. Hospitals that had vendor seven and eight had enormous variability. And uh, what we learned from that is that there was far more variability in test performance based on um, uh, hospitals themselves rather than their vendor. And so the vendor actually accounted for only about 27% of the variation. The point of this being is that the safety performance was much more determined by the hospitals themselves than the vendor, i.e., uh, the real impact here was how the hospitals locally customized, configured, and implemented their system. That was the major determinant of performance, not which vendor they chose. Um, and I think prior to this work, people had thought that uh, it was all re mostly related to the vendor. It was not. Uh, and newer data that we've collected with this test continues to show this issue that this is much about the implementation, configuration, and customization of your system, not what vendor you buy. Um, and I, I think that's an important issue for how we currently approach certification and other issues. Um, uh, it's not enough to look at vendor software on the shelf. We really have to look at it as it's operated by uh, hospitals, uh, clinics, et cetera. Next slide, please. So when we look at uh, the use of this test by hospitals in the United States, um, uh, we, what we find is that there's been a big uptake. Um, 
uh, in 2016, we crossed the 1,400 hospital line. And hospitals have generally been improving their performance on the test. Um, and this is based on uh, the overall score of the test. This is LeapFrog's configuration of that. It has to do with how many categories the hospitals get 50% or more on. And if they get 50% or more on six categories, they can be fully implemented. Um, so overall, the hospitals have improved on this test. We have a new publication coming out that will look at this in more detail, uh, probably within about six months. Uh, but I think the bottom line is that uh, hospitals who take this test seem to learn from it and improve. Um, next slide, please. But they don't learn and improve in every category. In the more basic decision support categories, hospitals have done fairly well in allergy, in duplication, in drug-drug um, uh, interactions, uh, and even in route, hospitals have done fairly well. But many years into the availability of this test, there's still great challenges in critical um, uh, safety issues, uh, such as um, decision support around drug diagnosis. Um, we still see an enormous problem there, the hospital failing to detect significant drug diagnosis problems, uh, uh, pregnancy being a big one, but there are many others as well. Ordering of corollary tests. We order amiodarone, do we order an appropriate laboratory test? Still great issues there. And, and then the other very big issue is adjusting a dose of a medication for a patient's uh, laboratory values or even age um, continue to be great challenges. And, and I think this is a little bit uh, stunning given the fact that meaningful use has really pushed must, many hospitals down this road. I would have expected uh, in the era of meaningful use to have an uptick in all these categories but uh, not the case, and our most recent data suggests that these categories uh, at the lower level continue to be a big problem. Next slide. So uh, ARC has funded uh, more work in this area. David Bates and I have been funded by ARC in a five-year project uh, to take this test and, uh, and update it and develop new capabilities and look at what we've uh, learned so far. Uh, next slide. And uh, the first thing we've been doing is looking at the retrospe retrospective experience with this test. Um, um, this year we have uh, over 1,400 hospitals that have taken it, but we have a long cohort a number of years with more than 800 hospitals in it. We even have a cohort of 176 hospitals that have been taking the test every year since 2009. So we've been studying uh, that uh, group intensively. Our first publication out of this will be published probably in about four to six months. Um, but there will be several publications to come in terms of what we've learned from this test. And clearly those learnings will influence um, uh, the other aims of the project, which we'll talk about, uh, and, and we will look at, at clearly what happens over time in this project with the updated test. Next slide. So what we're doing in updating the test is we've completely uh, created a new technical platform. Uh, uh, which we hope will be easier to use and more reliable to use. Um, and uh, that's been the first part of the project. The second part of the project is to update all the content in the test, uh, make sure uh, we understand the latest in formularies, labs, procedures, and make sure we understand the latest capabilities within the leading EHR vendors, and also allow organizations to uh, report um, the results of this test uh, uh, to their patient safety organization. But we put a lot of effort in this in making sure we can create as usable a test as possible. Um, next slide. Uh, as well, one of the aims of the project is to develop uh, new domains in the test. Um, uh, the new domains are uh, touching on common hospital complications, such as central line infections and deep venous thrombosis, uh, also focused on uh, reducing the overuse of meds, labs, and diagnostic tests also uh, focused on uh, usability. We will begin evaluating that. Um, and then finally, um, uh, uh, incorporating into the test um, health IT-related errors, and Jason Alleman is going to talk all about uh, his tool, which we are incorporating into the test. Next slide. So just uh, more detail about these new categories. 
we'll be adding a choosing wisely category, looking at inappropriate ordering of medications, laboratory tests, and radiology tests. An example of that might be uh, ordering vitamin D levels in a low-risk patient. Can an operational system pick that up? Prevention of common hospital complications, appropriate ordering of interventions to prevent hospital complications. We're going to focus on CLABC and DVT. So uh, we might test for the ordering of appropriate interventions for patients with central lines in place, either in the placement of those central lines or in the maintenance of those central lines, for example. Usability of clinical decision support. We'll be evaluating the usability of common decision support. We'll be using the IMADESA tool to do that. And then EHR error detection. We'll be evaluating common EHR errors, and we'll be using Jason Adelman's order, reorder, retract tool, um, which Jason will talk about. Next slide, please. So uh, what have we learned uh, so far in this project? Well, it really is hard to keep up with uh, what therapies in terms of patient care are current. There are many ways to deliver decision support. And frankly, most hospitals don't have a good sense of where they are in uh, the overall safety operation of their systems. These systems are complex, dynamic, uh, adaptive systems, and they're changing all the time. And an alert that was running a month ago may have been inactivated with a recent update, and nobody knows about it. And indeed, we found this a lot in our testing, is that uh, people had assumed alerts were still being turned on, um, and uh, uh, an upgrade, complex as they are, turned it off. Nobody knew about it. And then unsafe medication orders sailed right through the system because the doctor never saw an alert, assumed the system was checking. The pharmacist never saw an alert, assumed the system was checking. The nurse never saw an alert, assumed the system was checking, and uh, then just gave uh, the medication. And in the old days, when we had all three different safety nets, the doctor worried about the order, the pharmacist worried about the order, and the nurse worried about the order, and they all would consistently uh, be a separate safety net. Now that the systems are in place, what we find is people don't act like a safety net anymore. It takes a while, but that culture eventually sits in. And so that's why these complex adaptive systems are potentially more dangerous. It's because the old safety nets go away as people begin to trust the system. Indeed, I, I, I queried a group of uh, uh, residents, medical residents recently, uh, if um, a common alert uh, when they ordered a medication no longer popped up, uh, would they uh, believe that this was a problem with the system or would they just trust the system to uh, uh, be adequately informing them? And most of the residents said uh, if an alert stopped popping up, they think it, the system had just uh, uh, adequately checked and there was no problem. So I do think we're seeing a lot of the issues here that we see in automation with airline pilots. You can over-automate this, and people become uh, dependent on the system and believe that the system's checking when it may not actually be checking because of an upgrade or what have you. Next slide. So a lot of hospitals have taken this test, and our data is suggesting that hospitals who take the test actually do learn and improve. Uh, we certainly have, uh, over the years, modified the test with feedback from the broader community, and we're continuing to do that now. Um, the new test is a, both a technology complete rewrite. Uh, the content uh, is being dramatically upgraded as well. The workflow is going to stay pretty much the same. We've iterated that many times, and more hospitals are taking the test uh, every year. Next slide. Uh, some of the challenges in the take the test is that uh, vendors don't often make it easier to set up patients, uh, test patients with real lab data, uh, but a lot of places have gotten around this. Uh, there are many ways to deliver decision support, so what we're working hard on is uh, finding ways to give hospitals a credit for things beyond alerts, um, and we're working aggressively to try to give hospitals credit for making something not orderable this way or putting order sentences in places. So that's a big part of the uptime uh, of, the, uh, of the upgrade of the test. Next slide, please. So uh, recommendations, uh, please sign up and take the test. Uh, we think it will give you good feedback on how to uh, both make things better but also to find things that are broken that you didn't know about. And uh, we think hospitals should take the test regularly. They can take it every six months now because we found that things do break. Some really innovative uh, hospitals and health systems have actually written the passing of this test into their contracts with their vendors or their implementers or both, such that uh, the vendors or the implementers don't get full payment unless the hospital passes the test. 
Uh, I think that's a, a clever idea and, and clearly has had an impact. Uh, it certainly is a strong way to align incentives. Next slide, please. Um, we know that when you buy an EHR, it typically comes with little or no decision support. And um, there's a huge variation among hospitals as to what is actually operationally implemented. Um, and um, uh, that's why we see so much variability on the test. But I think we do know uh, from the literature now that if you perform better on this test, you're going to likely have lower rates of adverse drug events, which is what the test is designed to focus on. But I think the bottom line here is that we can't assume because of what vendor software looks like on the shelf that it will automatically perform just that way as we implement it. I think uh, we, we, we now understand that the, uh, there is so much variability in local configuration and customization and operation in this complex adaptive system that's an EMR that uh, we must test to know exactly what uh, is going on on a regular basis. Next slide. So um, uh, if you have any questions or concerns, you can email me here, and you can also ask questions on this. So with that, I will turn it back over, and I think uh, Jason Alleman will pick it up next. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Klassen. This is Ed Lomaten again. Uh, as a reminder, we'll be taking questions after both presentations, so uh, please submit your questions you have for Dr. Klassen using the Q&A panel on the right. Um, and now let me introduce uh, Dr. Edelman. Uh, Dr. Edelman is the Chief Patient Safety Officer and Associate Chief Quality Officer for Columbia University Medical Center and New York Presbyterian Hospital. Dr. Edelman received his medical degree from Sackler School of Medicine and a Master's of Science from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine's Clinical Research Training Program. And he focuses his research on the use of health information technology to prevent medical errors. He's currently the PI on several ARC-funded health IT safety research projects. Dr. Edelman is a member of the National Quality Forum Committee on Patient Safety Measures, the Board of Advisors for the National Patient Safety Foundation, and the editorial board of the Journal for Healthcare Quality. Dr. Edelman was also named one of 50 experts leading the field of patient safety by Becker's Hospital Review. Uh, and so now I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Edelman. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm going to follow up um, David's great talk um, by um, narrowing um, in a little bit on one particular health IT um, related issue, um, wrong patient errors. So um, first, wrong patient errors, it's not a, a new problem. Um, this uh, article you see in front of you is actually from 1820. Almost 200 years ago, um, this is from the Gazette of Health from London, and they wrote, having another patient of the same name in the hospital whose complaint was violent spasms and flatulence of the stomach, the prussic acid was by mistake administered to the wrong patient, a circumstance highly creditable to the apothecary and by no means uncommon in London hospitals. So it's pretty remarkable. It's almost 200 years later, and we're still dealing with the same issue. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story. This is um, based uh, on a true case, although um, the identifiers were changed um, to protect those involved. Mrs. X, an 87-year-old female with a history of hypertension, COPD, coronary artery disease, and hypothyroidism, was admitted to a telemetry unit with a diagnosis of rapid AFib and bronchitis. The day after admission, a medicine resident, a PGY-1, accidentally placed an order for methadone 70 milligrams for Mrs. X, which he meant to order for another patient. Both patients were on the resident's hot list in the electronic health record. A pharmacist signed off on the methadone order, and later that day, a nurse in training who was working under the supervision of an experienced nurse administered the medication. Several hours later, Mrs. X was observed to be restless, and complaining of being hot and nauseated. Shortly thereafter, Mrs. X was found unresponsive, pulseless, and with blue extremities. A code was called. She was intubated and transferred to the MICU. So this was a real um, Swiss cheese sort of error where a resident placed the order on the wrong patient, pharmacist missed it, and then a nurse who was um, not very experienced and not um, being supervised as closely as they should have been 
let the methadone order go through, experienced nurses know that we don't give big doses of methadone to little old ladies. So I'm going to go over what we know about wrong patient errors, much of this before um, some of um, my research, um, talk a little bit about voluntary reporting of errors and the automated detection of errors that's now um, possible with electronic health records, and then specifically research on detecting wrong patient errors and how to prevent wrong patient errors, and a little bit about um, the future of health IT safety measures. So what do we know about wrong patient errors? Um, Initially, we had some information from case reports and expert opinions, some voluntary reporting, and some articles on chart review. This is a case report from the Institute of Safe Medication Practice, ISMP, uh, from 2011. They called it, oops, sorry, wrong patient, and they talked about um, a patient who actually died um, from placing an order on the wrong patient. Um, they wound up ordering some sedatives on somebody who was already in some respiratory distress by mistake. Um, ISMP, of course, was founded by Michael Cohen, and Michael Cohen um, um, authors this book called Medication Errors with information that um, comes from a lot of consulting work that ISMP does um, with hospitals around the country, and then they collect many um, voluntary reported adverse events related to medications from around the country. And um, uh, Michael spoke about wrong patient errors um, from those experiences in his book. This was um, an article published in JAMA um, from the Brigham where they did chart review looking at um, over 1,000 patients, specifically focusing on medication errors and near-miss errors, and they found one um, wrong patient error that made it through and one near-miss wrong patient error. Um, and then this is the, I guess, best quantitative data that I had found um, prior to some of the work that I'm going to share that we had done, this is from the voluntary reporting system uh, MedMarks. 120 facilities participated, and they found um, in about a year, they found a mean of nine wrong patient errors per facility, um, so about nine per year that were voluntary reported. Um, now, the... Um, David mentioned um, a lot of great health IT safety research that David himself has done, and David Bates, and he mentioned Joan Ash. And when it came to wrong patient errors, Joan Ash um, came up with this term, juxtaposition error, uh, where she wrote, the, it's the kind of error that can result when something is close to something else on the screen and the wrong option is too easily clicked in error. So um, two um, patients are listed on a list of a bunch of patients, and you mean to click on one patient, but you accidentally click on, on the other. And the thought early on was that juxtaposition errors was in large part the reason for um, why wrong patient errors were, were happening in, in, in the world of electronic health record. So, but let's talk a little bit about voluntary reporting errors, because a lot of our initial data came from voluntary reported errors. Um, Here's another old uh, article. This one is from 1886, so more like 150 years. And this is from New York State, where I am now. Um, the uh, Manual for Attendance in Insane Asylums. And it, they wrote, attendants must remember that many medicines are injurious or even poisonous if not properly given or if mixed with other medicines or if given to the wrong patient. They should therefore never make a mistake or if by carelessness they commit one, should immediately report it. So to me, this is sort of funny, 150 years old, and it covers so many things. First of all, they say, you know, the approach to patient safety is never make a mistake, which I find funny. Uh, but they again talk about wrong patient errors, and, and they talked about reporting errors back 150 years ago. So um, here's a study from Health Affairs that um, David Classett and colleagues um, reported, looking at different um, means of, of collecting uh, 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 errors, and you'll see that from voluntary reporting in this study, they had found four, where they had found 354 using triggers and chart review. Um, so about 1% of the errors were voluntary reported, which you hear that rule of thumb a lot, about 1% of errors, and, uh, and, and you can see it here in this study. Now, some folks with the um, advent of electronic records have started working on automated detection methods of errors, and I'm going to go over some study, again, David Bates and David Klass and, um, and, and Ross Capel have done some of this work, and I'm going to share some, um, some of their work. Ross Capel um, published this study um, where he looked at orders that were discontinued within two hours with the general theory that um, if somebody orders something 
and then this continues it shortly after it's ordered, and if they're not going home or being transferred to the surgery, but they just order it and discontinue it, there's a good chance that it might be an error. And so they interviewed Ross and his colleagues, 75 physicians, and 55% of them, in fact, confirmed they were um, error, different types of, of errors. Um, David Claston, who spoke earlier, um, did a more robust study um, looking at more than 36,000 patients over 18 months and had multiple signals that helped identify errors. So discontinuing was one of them, but they also looked at antidotes, like for example, giving naloxone might be a signal for someone who had a narcotic um, error or overdose. Um, actually, that happened with the case that I started off this presentation with, or abnormal lab values and so forth. And using these different automated triggers, they found um, 731 adverse drug events after each of the triggers was reviewed by a pharmacist, but only nine of them were reported by voluntary reporting. Again, sort of confirming that about 1% of errors um, being voluntary reported. Um, this is a, a, a different study done where I am now at Columbia, where um, Genevieve Melton and George Ripsack used natural language processing to look at discharge summaries, looking at um, for serious adverse events. In New York, we report our serious adverse events to NIPORTS, and they were looking for um, if we're missing any serious events that should be reported, and we're able to almost double um, the, those that were identified. Um, and so usually, um, if 1% of errors are reported, those that are going to be reported are the most serious adverse events, like the story I told you. If you give methadone to a little old lady by accident, she stops breathing, that is usually going to be reported. If we order uh, CBC on the wrong patient and it gets through, they may not hear that. But even still, with natural language processing, they're able to find many more adverse events. Um, so now I'm going to share some of my research on detecting wrong patient errors. And we came up with, you know, really what's a very simple model but proved to be effective. We looked for when doctors um, or anyone who can place orders, um, PAs, nurse practitioners, uh, pharmacists, nurses, when they order something on a patient and then they cancel it pretty quickly. We set a limit. We tried different limits but settled on 10 minutes and then order the exact same thing on another patient. So you order Tylenol, X-ray, um, and, and a catheter on a patient, cancel all three of them, and then immediately order it on somebody else. The programmer that helped me with this used to call it the oops query, like, oops, I'm on the wrong patient. Let me correct that. Now we call it the retract and reorder measure. Um, so we did this methodology. We found uh, at Montefiore Medical Center, where we did the study, in one year, we found almost 7,000 retract and reorder events. And even though we set a limit of 10 minutes, uh, the retraction on average was one minute and 18 seconds. So when providers caught themselves, they usually caught themselves pretty quickly. We um, got IRB approval and we called 236 of these people who made these errors and we set up a safe environment, told them everything would be kept confidential. And then we asked them when you ordered you know, the uh, x-ray and Tylenol on Mr. Smith and then canceled it and then ordered it on Mr. Jones about an hour ago, um, was that a wrong patient error? And 76.2% confirmed it was a wrong patient error. Um, this measure is now um, the first health IT safety measure that's been endorsed by uh, NQF for identifying wrong patient errors. Um, and in the um, Montefiore study, even when we corrected that 6,885 for the 76.2% positive predictive value, it was still over 5,000 wrong patient errors a day. Uh, um, sorry, a year, 14 a day, one out of every six providers placed an order on the wrong patient, even for a limited amount of time, and one out of every 37 patients admitted to the hospital for a short period of time had an order placed for them that was meant for, for somebody else. And everything you, you can think of was ordered on the wrong patient, chemo, restraint, do not resuscitate, catheters, enemas, NPO, discharging patients home, narcotics, um, pretty much everything. Now, I, I remind you that the real quantitative um, evidence that I found before this work of how many wrong patient errors would happen were about nine, and we found 5,246. And now, of course, all of these are near miss errors, and actually most of the ones in the men marks were also near miss errors, but the importance um, uh, of this tool was that with, with this number of self-court errors, we could test interventions. We, it, it, we don't rely on voluntary reporting. It's reliable um, and effective. And we were able to look at now who's 
replacing wrong patient errors because we had so many. So, for example, physicians had twice the error rate of nurses. And I'm not sure why, but I can hypothesize maybe for physicians, there are residents who are moonlighting at night and maybe they've never even met the patient and they just have a sign-out sheet that says if so-and-so is in pain, give them Percocet, where nurses spend a lot more time at the bedside. Some of these other findings I'm just not even sure of, like, for example, um, the radiology test had twice the wrong patient error rate as lab tests. Um, or the emergency department, I would have thought, would have had the highest error rate, but it was actually half that of the outpatient arena, and I'm not sure why that is. Um, uh, Tejal Gandhi um, had recommended to me that we do something that she and David Bates had done in some of their studies where even though, oh, even though these were all near-miss errors, what would have happened if these errors had gone through and not been caught um, by the providers? And so we um, rated them by life-threatening, serious, or clinically significant. And you could see 166 in that year would have been life-threatening, 359 serious, and over 1,000 clinically significant. Now, there, there was other studies that we found that were somewhat consistent. So this is another study that, again, was done at Columbia, where I am now, that didn't look at wrong patient errors. It looked at wrong notes. Um, written on the wrong chart. And they had a similar method of finding wrong notes in the sense that if you write a note on the wrong patient and you realize it, you'd be incredibly motivated to fix that note. And so there's a mechanism here to um, request that a note be moved and they're self-caught you know, errors. And, and they had found 51 notes for every 100,000 notes written on the wrong patient. And we had found 58 errors for every 100,000 orders written for the wrong patient. So, so consistent. Um, now, I'll remind you, I had said earlier that Joan Ash um, uh, um, uh, coined this term juxtaposition error, and there was a lot of thought that this was the main reason for wrong patient errors, just two names, one above the other, and accidentally click on the wrong error. But we actually found something different. When we called those 236 providers and asked them, did you make a wrong patient error, and 76% confirmed that they did, for those that said they did make a wrong patient error, we then had the opportunity to ask them why, and we had some structured questions to um, try to get down to that answer. And actually, only 10% said it was juxtaposition. 80% said it was um, interruption or distraction. Um, they were admitting Mr. Smith, had all the papers in front of them, in, in placing all the orders, and then they get a call that Mr. Jones is in pain. Can you order Percocet? So they switch to Mr. Jones and order the Percocet, and right then they get interrupted. Um, they have a five-minute conversation with their colleague, and then they finish Mr. Smith's admission, forgetting that um, they had toggled to Mr. Jones. And so the rest of Mr. Smith's er uh, orders go on Mr. Jones. That was um, by far the most common reason for wrong patient errors. And it's someone um, counterintuitive because um, – Often, after publishing some of this work, people talk to me about wrong patient errors, and they often think it's similar names on the unit. And certainly that um, can contribute, but this was an abstract presented to Amy by some of my colleagues here now at Columbia, where they looked at retract and reorder events and looked at how similar the names were, and only 3% had similar sounding names, which, again, is sort of consistent with that there's another cause, and from, from our other study, probably distraction is the, is the big issue. So what about preventing um, these errors? Um, we, we, it, Mrs. X, going back to, to that case and the methadone on the little old lady, um, there was an RCA done and a peer review looked at the case, and the peer review committee recognized how easy it was for the system to allow this error. The checks and balances were not effective. This is exactly the kind of stuff that um, David Klassen just presented, like testing where are the failures. So the, the peer review committee recognized that the system failed to catch the error and let it through. And as part of corrective action plans, um, they looked for the formation of a subcommittee to look at what system modifications can be made to prevent wrong patient errors. And there was two um, ideas put forth. One was a very simple pop-up that would just confirm before you can place any orders, you, a user would have to um, read the pop-up and make sure that the patient that they're about to place orders on in their mind is the same one that they're actually on and confirm it by this pop-up. Now, there were um, folks on this committee that was looking at it, I thought this was not a very good idea, that people would just blow by this um, pop-up and just hit OK. Um, and so there was another proposal that if you see there's two stop signs there, the middle stop sign, the one more in the middle of the screen, next to it there's a little white box, and next to that it says initials, uh, age, and gender. So 
they proposed a more intrusive intervention where instead of a pop-up, you'd actually have to type in the patient's initials, age, and gender. Um, but the folks that were opposed to this said, you know, doctors will rebel against this. You can't stop them um, every time they want to go place a bunch of orders and ask them to reconfirm in this way. Now, now um, the pop-up and, and this intrusive intervention, um, it was designed to happen once um, before an order session. So you could be, you'd enter the system, read some notes, look at some labs, and then when you go to place some orders, you'd reconfirm, and then you can go on and place all the orders you wanted. And so really the group that was looking at half wanted the pop-up and half wanted this. So we designed um, a three-arm study where um, a third of the patients would would have the old system with nothing, a third would have the pop-up, and a third would have this more intrusive intervention. And so it turned out that um, um, I, I had met some folks um, um, around this time who was doing similar work, and um, somebody had um, the pop-up at New York Presbyterian, where I am now, but I wasn't at the time, and, um, and then Johns Hopkins had some form of entering the intrusive intervention. They had put this stuff in place, but they had no way of evaluating it because they hadn't yet sort of come up with an automated measure of testing the effectiveness, and when you only have nine reports a year, you can't use voluntary reporting. Um, so we um, did our study. We had about 1,300, you know, plus or minus in each arm of the study, over a million orders in each arm of the study. And here's what we found. The, um, the pop-up compared to control reduced wrong patient errors by 16%, which was um, statistically significant. But the more intrusive intervention reduced wrong patient errors by, by 41%, which was much more um, meaningful, and, and we wound up turning that on across the institution. Now, the um, New York Presbyterian pop-up that I, that I showed you, um, going back, uh, oops, I went too far back, um, this one here, um, they would do it not just at the beginning of an order session, but they would do it for every order, um, and they would hold it on the screen for two and a half seconds. Um, and also they had, um, it wasn't just validating who the patient was, they listed some of the problems and some of the meds, thinking that perhaps um, that would r help remind the provider um, who, who the um, patient was. And while our pop-up had a 16% reduction, their pop-up had a 30% reduction, um, which was uh, more effective. And some people ask sometimes, you know, when you use these pop-ups, um, eventually do people get used to it and sort of did they lose effect over time? And so part of what they evaluated is the initial reduction using the pop-up was 30%, but they collected data for two years and um, it, they pretty much maintained a 25% reduction over time. And so really it did work um, not just in the short term but for the long term. Um, now, to be fair, there's an editorial came out um, along with the article that said, but what about this 2.5 seconds every time you place an order, not just for an order session? That's a lot of time. Um, and so they, this editorial points out just a few seconds, 130 million times a year. And so there's no question that there's a trade-off um, to prevent wrong patient errors or perhaps to prevent any errors. Um, if you have to stop someone and get them to think, maybe it's a timeout in the OR, that costs time, and sometimes costing time can cause other errors, and so we're constantly balancing um, the steps we need to put in place um, to make a system safer versus the, the time it costs to make a system safer. So uh, we had seen, it, 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 our pop-up um, in the initial study was only up there by an average of a half a second, which means that many people really were just blowing by it, and there was only a 16% reduction. At two and a half seconds, there was a 30% reduction, and the more intrusive intervention, um, it was 6.6 .6 seconds for 41% reduction. I personally think that um, to prevent wrong patient errors, um, it's going to take a multi-pronged approach. So some kind of validation. I mean, when we order things on Amazon.com, we validate at the end that we got the order right. Some kind of, and that our credit card information is right. Some kind of validation. Um, here's a study that was done by some colleagues, uh, University of Illinois, where they showed that you could also identify wrong patient errors by looking at the problem list and looking at if the order makes sense in the context of the patient. So if you order Synthroid uh, and the patient does not have hypothyroidism on the problem list, it's either that the problem list is not up to date and you can remind someone to update the problem list or you're on the wrong patient. And so it's just another sort of 
uh, another approach that you can mix in with an intrusive intervention, making sure the order makes sense with what we know about the patient and the EHR, and then patient photos. This, this is an interesting study where um, they showed um, the year prior to implementing photos to the year after, photos went from, errors went from 12 to 3. And it went from 12 to 3 because they were using voluntary reported errors. Um, and so you can see there's not like a lot of power here. And um, when you use voluntary reported errors as an outcome measure, it, it, um, you, you, it's hard to know if the effect was um, because the intervention worked, even though I absolutely believe photos work, um, or if you change the culture of reporting, maybe because there are photos, people think, oh, my God, I'm really supposed to be um, getting this right, and they don't want to report anymore. As we said, only 1% of errors are really reported. So you're really, um, in this before-after study, you're really subject to a temporal bias and also a reporting bias. Nonetheless, I think that photos are a good idea and may need it um, with um, validating the patient and checking for uh, indications. So we extended some of this research to the NICU. I had been told as the patient safety officer that um, after doing this work that we have a particular problem in the NICU. And the issue in the NICU is that when children are born in most hospitals, um, parents sometimes don't have the name ready to go, and so hospitals just adopt a system to um, assign a temporary name like baby boy, baby girl. The way it usually works is a uh, labor delivery calls admitting. Admitting makes a copy of the patient's record um, so that it, uh, the, sorry, labor delivery makes a copy of the mother's record, at least the insurance and the address, because all that's going to be the same for the baby. The same last name as the mother, and then they just tag on baby boy or baby girl, and now you have a record for the baby. But the problem is in the NICU, then you have all these baby boy Jones, baby boy Jackson, baby boy Johnson, and often medical record numbers are given out sequentially. And so you have very similar identifiers. And this was a study in pediatrics by Jim Gray that he looked at all the children in the NICU and compared them to each other and said at any given time he thought that over 50% of the kids were at risk for wrong patient error because they were all named baby boy, baby girl. Um, the medical record numbers were given out sequentially. The kids born generally in the same time, very similar. And really all you had was the last name. Um, and so... He thought that uh, there was a significant chance that the error, wrong patient error rate in the NICU was higher, but he didn't have, like, the retract and reorder tool to measure it. And so when we applied, here's, um, sorry, a screenshot of what, like, a NICU looks like with baby boy, baby girl, and you can see how similar all the kids look. Um, well, when we looked at the wrong patient error rate, we used general pediatrics um, where, you know, everybody has their names compared to the NICU, and the error rate was, in fact, 1.6 times higher, which was consistent with um, Jim Gray's theory. And when you looked at multiples, because multiples, it's really like um, um, if you have twins or triplets, the identifiers are so similar. Baby girl Edelman A, baby girl Edelman B, baby girl Edelman C, and the medical record numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8. They're just so similar. And the error rate was, in fact, even higher, 1.8 times that of the general peds. Um, we wanted to know if this was a, 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 a real national problem. So we did a quick survey through the American Academy of Pediatrics, and we were able to reach 335 NICUs, which is about 40% of the NICUs in the country. And it turns out that just about 82% of the NICUs reported that they were doing something like this. The most common name that was used was baby boy, baby girl. 82% um, of the NICUs was using a non-distinct name. Baby boy, baby girl was most common, followed by BBBG, um, and then boy, girl, and then other rarer things like master and miss and things like that. And so we had a theory, what if we just, instead of calling the children baby boy or baby girl, um, what if we use the mother's first name, Mary's girl, Linda's girl, Judy's girl, things like that. Maybe that would uh, decrease the wrong patient error rate. Um, and so we tried it at, at uh, Montreal Medical Center, where I was at the time, and it turns out that it was actually quite effective, that the wrong patient error rate, just by doing that the year before to the year prior, went down by 36.3%. We used the retract and reorder um, measure to get enough uh, um, um, events to study it, and, and really was quite effective. And then um, because of the, the effectiveness of it, the um, Joint Commission actually made it a national recommendation to stop using baby boy, baby girl, and, and use a more distinct name like implementing the mother's first name. Um, 
And what about when uh, multiple records are open? Um, a lot of people have uh, asked me about this. They were concerned that when you allow four records open, they would increase the risk of wrong patient errors. And this is an example. It looks like Internet Explorer where you just open different browsers, but you have different patients. Um, I actually did a, a national survey to see if this was an issue, and I asked CMIOs, how many records do you allow open, how many, sorry, how many records does your system allow open, how many records do you choose to allow open, and, and why? And it turns out that about 40%, you can see I had it separated by inpatient systems and outpatient systems, and, but they're both similar. About 40% chose the maximum, um, and then about 40% chose the minimum, and then about 17% hedged, about 20% hedged, um, and when they hedge, they usually hedge to two. And when we asked them why, um, those that chose uh, uh, the maximum three or more um, said that the efficiency benefits sort of outweighed any risk, and there are other ways to prevent wrong patient errors. And those that chose the minimum said that they were very concerned about wrong patient errors. Some even um, had some wrong patient errors, and um, they really wanted to have the safest system possible. And those that hedged at two saw both the pros and cons. Um, one um, respondent wrote, Two seems to represent the sweet spot between efficiency and safety as long as training is present to mitigate the risks. So you can see there's real equipoise. People don't know what to do. And um, we're um, uh, funded by HRQ um, to study that question. That's an ongoing study now using the retract and reorder measure to see if um, when you increase the number of records open, does that increase um, wrong patient errors. And so finally, um, I have an, uh, an R01 that we're um, doing now to look at if we can develop additional measures um, similar to the wrong patient error measure using that retract and reorder concept um, to, to isolate different kind of, of, of errors. So for example, if, if, you, if you see here, um, the blue dots represent all orders placed, and then right after that, I, I, I show rapid retraction. It was the ross Capel theory that if things are canceled shortly after they're placed, there's a good chance there, there's an error. But if you see what happens next, maybe you can isolate the error. So what we did with the wrong patient error um, measure is we looked to see, well, if somebody places the exact same order on a different patient and changes the patient, that could be a wrong patient error. And if you can isolate the type of error, you could then study interventions as we did. But what if instead of changing patients after they cancel it, they re immediately reorder on the same patient, but they change the drug. So you order clonidine, cancel it quickly, and then the same doctor orders clonopin, and then reorders it on the, wrong, uh, on the same patient. Maybe that's a wrong drug error. Or orders something, cancels the dose, and then immediately reorders it and increases the dose by 2.2 or decreases it by 2.2. Maybe somebody confused pounds and kilograms. So we're evaluating new measures now and with a, with a plan to test them at several institutions and then um, um, any new measures we make submit to NQF for endorsement and then to share them so that others can test interventions. So in summary, wrong patient errors are common. Voluntary reporting greatly underestimates actual errors. Automated tools for identifying errors shows great promise. Multiple synergistic interventions will likely be needed to truly eliminate the hazard of wrong patient errors, and more re research is needed um, in, in, for all these issues. And just quickly, um, Mrs. X, the, the, the little old lady that got um, the methadone, shortly after she was intubated, the error was discovered. She was given Narcan 0.4 milligrams and became alert with normal pupils. Her mental status returned to baseline and she was weaned off the ventilator and extubated within a few hours of being transferred to the MICU. She remained alert and oriented and was discharged home two days after the error was made. Um, so with that, I will pass it back over to Ed. Thanks, Jason, very much. Uh, and thanks to, to both you and David for your very um, informative presentations. Great job, thank you. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can submit questions for either of them uh, using your Q&A panel to the right. And so um, we do have some time to take some questions. And what I'm going to do is essentially go through some of the questions that um, you've submitted so far. Um, and we're not going to necessarily be able to get to all of them, but please know that um, we do answer all of them in writing and send the answers out to all of the attendees. So if you don't hear your question, um, please know that we will uh, ask the presenters to get to them after the webinar is completed. Um, and in some cases, I'm going to um, uh, perhaps paraphrase or combine uh, the questions 
um, to generate the most discussion um, and to take advantage of the time of our presenters. So uh, with that in mind, let's, um, let's go get to it. The first question I'm going to actually pose to um, you, David. Um, there are lots of questions we've got around um, whether the um, LeapFrog tool can be used for primary care or other ambulatory care settings. Can you comment on that? I need to unmute myself. Um, it's a great question. So um, when we originally developed this tool, we developed a pediatric inpatient and a pediatric outpatient version of it, and um, we developed a uh, adult inpatient and adult outpatient version of it. Um, we only have funding from ARC to update the adult inpatient version of it. But we, since we already have the team together and we already have the prior content, if we had more funding, we could update and bring back the pediatric inpatient, the adult ambulatory, and the pediatric ambulatory. So um, we're looking actively looking for funding to bring them back because we have the prior content, we have the team, and it would be fairly easy for us to bring it back. We've had a lot of hospitals and clinics reach out to us and say, pediatric hospitals or ambulatory clinics, we'd really like to have access to a tool that. So when we do have funding, uh, we can bring it back, but it's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, great, great question. Um, Jason, I'm going to pose the next question to you. Um, this person is asking whether um, um, providers, when they have sort of caught themselves and retract and reorder, do they seem to, to learn from the experience over time? Do, they, do their rates change? Um, that's a, another great question. And I have to say, we didn't look at um, particular um, providers and their rates over time, but what I could say is we looked at uh, the organization over time, and without any interventions, um, the error rate was pretty steady over time. And, and I suspect that, um, that these errors are more about um, the systems than they are about the providers, meaning that um, we need to um, just make our systems um, safer and uh, more resilient to wrong patient errors. Uh, but it's a good question, and it's actually something we can look into. Thanks. Um, I'm going to pose this question to both of you. Maybe I'll start with you, David. Um, and it's sort of a, a general question around, um, you know, alerting um, and you know, the achieving some safety benefit for patients, but also um, balancing that with alert fatigue. So the question is, um, have you looked at, or um, in the course of your work, um, what the response has been to the alert and, and, and who is monitoring those responses? So, Dave, I can start with you, please. Yeah, um, clearly the alert fatigue is a big issue. We have a component of the test called the nuisance category. We're going to rename it the alert fatigue category. And we have data coming to show that uh, that's a big issue. Um, uh, we've been tracking that since 2008. But we're going to reconfigure that uh, category, call it the alert fatigue category, and really emphasize on measuring uh, scenarios where we think there should be no alerting whatsoever. Um, the uh, way people respond to these is, is absolutely critical. And um, I think um, <clears throat> the challenge here is twofold. One, people tend to blow by them um, uh, and uh, ignore them. Uh, unless it's a really significant alert. The other challenge is that if the alert gets turned off, let's say, by accident, in the old days, if a physician ordered Coumadin 5 milligrams three times a day um, and uh, there was an alert, they'd pay attention to it and they react to it. But if the alert gets turned off, um, what we found is that the, the, uh, the safety checks of the pharmacist and the nurse after these systems have been in place for a while, the socio-technical framework changes, and rather than doing independent checking of the danger of that kind of drug dose, they often just let it slide, assuming that the system had checked it. And so the way people react to alerts has changed over time socio-technically as these systems stay in place for a while. I think in the old days we thought, well, don't worry, if the alert doesn't get portrayed to the doctor, the pharmacist will pick it up or the nurse will pick it up. That has really changed in the world of uh, these socio-technical systems. So 
So I think there's a lot of concern about how people react to these alerts once they're overridden. Many people believe that the safest way to do it is if a doctor overrides an alert, that override needs to be displayed to both the pharmacist and the nurse so that they can understand that there may have been a problem here rather than just take the whole thing away, which is what often happens, and let it run through the rest of the system. So um, uh, I think this is an absolutely critical issue. What we're trying to do in the test is not just give people credit for alerts, but if people have actually made it impossible to order a medication like Tylenol intravenously, taken the alert out of it, and you just can't order it that way, we need to give them credit in the test, and we're changing the test so that people give that to them. Or if there's an order sentence that doesn't let you order Tylenol before a certain, beyond a certain range, so you don't get an alert, you just can't do it, we're going to give people credit for that as well. Great. Thank you. Good comments. Jason, any kind of comments you want to add around alert fatigue? Yeah, I can um, just say um, my experience as a patient safety officer and a health IT safety researcher that um, um, to me, it's as much about um, uh, art as it is science. That um, that uh, alert fatigue um, sometimes it is um, such an issue that alerts become completely dysfunctional, and sometimes alerts are quite effective. And it could have uh, as much to do about the context in which the alerts are being used. So, in an environment um, where um, a system is configured. Um, to have alerts for everything, um, every little uh, insignificant drug interaction versus the most significant potential lethal doses um, in, in such an environment that can really affect um, how any one given alert works. Or in another environment where a lot of the less significant interactions are shut off, they can be more effective. And, and the, even the context of what the alert is, if you're uh, reminding somebody that they're, hey, you know, you're on the wrong patient, that may grab their attention more than um, this is a drug-drug interaction. And so it's just so hard to even study um, the effectiveness because there's so many variables at play. Even in my presentation, I showed two alerts. One was a very um, small gray-on-gray -gray alert, and one was a bigger, colorful, um, more interactive alert. So when you take in, in that into play as well, it, it, I think actually um, David's slide that showed um, the variance of um, uh, how people performed um, on the using the leapfrog test based on all the different vendors, and you could see that um, it changes among vendors, but also even within a vendor, different hospitals are making different configuration choices, and a lot of them is about the number of alerts that they're using as it, just one example. Um, and that's why I say it's as much about art as science. Like it's um, so hard to study this stuff in the context of so many different things are moving. Um, and so, but I agree, it's a, what, what David Klassen said, it's a major issue and it's going to require a lot of work, but we know, we know it's a problem that needs addressing. And, and, and all I'd, I'd add is that I, I think Jason were, Jason's work shows you how we could study this issue. Uh, and I think Jason's approach would fit nicely into studying this uh, reaction to alerts approach. Um, and, and I think the, 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 the problem here is that um, you know, the IOM report on health ID and patient safety said we're not doing nearly enough with our electronic systems to measure and improve safety. That's still the case today. Yeah. yeah. Uh, this next question, I think, um, I think originally it posed to Jason, so I'll, I'll put it to you first, Jason. Um, but I think, David, you're going to have some, some good insights here as well. And, and really the question is around um, – the review process for certain orders and, and, and sort of their relationship to the greatest possibility for harm. So, you know, for example, should the intervention to prevent the wrong patient error, whatever you're trying to, to sort of um, detect, vary depending on the potential severity of the harm? Yeah, I have um, a colleague of mine who's um, trying to get a better understanding of of those kind of questions, meaning like we have so much um, wrong patient error data now that um, I focused on sort of very high-level analysis and preventing them, but not on the more nuanced. Um, it even goes to the alert fatigue questions. Perhaps um, we can um, 
we should only be alerting um, if it's a certain kind of medication that can be lethal and maybe it will be effective. So if you're ordering methadone on a little old lady, maybe double check then. But if you're ordering a CBC that pretty much everybody gets anyway, um, and that might be the much more common error, maybe we can hold off on, on some of, of those alerts to make the really important ones more effective. And so I, I, I haven't yet um, like analyzed at that level. As I mentioned, we're sort of doing that work now. Um, but I agree, David Klass and probably have some good insight on that question. Yeah, uh, Jason's right. I think um, uh, we could uh, use these systems to be smart alerters, right, and not alert on at ordering another CBC, but maybe order, uh, you know, uh, alert on a drug that could actually kill a fetus or kill a patient. Um, and so I think we can go a lot further in that direction uh, in terms of uh, really categorizing the risk of harm. Uh, from these interventions. Um, and we do a form of that in the test currently. We have a number of fatal orders in the test. We don't tell you which ones they are unless you fail them and then we show them to you. But it's amazing to me that still a number of places allow fatal orders to run right through the system. Um, and uh, and that's, that's a bit scary. Uh, so I do think some sort of approach that Jason has suggested is where we'll end up in, uh, in, in a number of years. Yeah. Great, but thank at, you at both. At least, you know, you should not allow fatal orders to run through the system, right? Yeah. It's sort of related to that, we are getting some questions around, um, you know, uh, multiple alerts for, for multiple audiences along that, as you said, Jason, sort of Swiss cheese pathway, right? So uh, if a doctor, for example, isn't seeing alert, but a pharmacist does, what is the pharmacist supposed to do? Or should there be differences in what alerts different um, audiences see? Um, maybe, Jason, I'll start with you. Yeah, like I said, I think it's as much, at now anyway, art as science. We're trying to understand it, and the more, um, as David said, we can use, like, retract and order measures, we can study these questions. But as of now, it's just hard to know. If you're, um, in the case of the methadone story that I told, um, it's the doctor who has the opportunity to um, be questioned about what patient they're placing orders on. They're the one who knows what they're trying to do. Once they place the order on the patient, now the pharmacist has to review, there's a methadone order on this patient. And from, from their point of view, it's what the doctor ordered, and, and um, so that's what it must have been. And, and, you know, maybe here they can get the... Um, indication sort of alert, like, wait a second, methadone doesn't make sense for a little old lady. Um, and, you know, whether that alert should go to the doctor when they provide it or the pharmacist or both, um, and the balance between alert fatigue for the doctor or the pharmacist and both, um, it's just hard to know now. We, we have to try different things, study them, and just keep narrowing down. I think this is going to be a journey for a lot of us to keep um, – trying different things, improving our ways of measuring it. And that was, uh, David said, the IOM report said, we just don't know enough about health IT safety um, is one of the major points of that, um, that report. And, um, and because we don't know, it's hard to study it. And so th I think that's some of the important of some of the measures we're developing. It's David. I don't have... I have much to add to Jason. I think he's, he's correct in his view. I think he has a wonderful operation and research group to actually study these issues and decide what's best. I think what we've learned from the LeapFrog tool is that transparency is really important. And showing the alerts to all the parts of the medication use process, from the doctor to the pharmacist to the nurse, is really important. So hiding alerts from the nurse that the doctor uh, ignored or overrode is not a good idea. So transparency is a basic principle, but how you actually ration out uh, 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 critical alerts to critical people, I think, is still yet to be determined. And Jason's got a great, I think, research platform to do just that. We're getting questions. Um, it's just, just sort of a, a bigger question. I know we're, we're getting close to the end of the hour, but maybe um, a sentence or two for both of you. The question is really around not so much using these tools and data to tweak an EHR, but really creating a learning environment for the organization, right? Using them, these tools, as part of uh, you know, creating new process and even training. Um, how do you guys envision these tools being used in that sort of way? So maybe, uh, David, I'll, I'll start with you. So uh, uh, if, if I understand the, the, uh, um, uh, the question correctly, is how do you use these tools to create a learning system, I guess, in your health system? 
Right, and so not so much around you know using the data to, to change literally something within the HR or tweak it, but that is sort of more I'm interpreting the question more along the lines of a cultural thing or organizational types of processes that you could use these in as opposed to just um, EHR you know technical fix. Well, you could you could use these as ongoing monitoring systems, live surveillance systems uh, that are continually looking at these systems and seeing how they're um, uh, how they're functioning, right? and a more real-time assessment of the actual performance of these tools. The airlines do a version of this, and so do the credit card companies. They have online uh, surveillance systems that are always looking for problems actively. Uh, and when they identify them, it usually gets put into a learning system loop as well as an intervention loop. So um, I think you, know, you could think ahead of this uh, in terms of a, a surveillance system that's continually looking for uh, order retract errors, and, and you might see it pop up in a unit uh, today, one unit in the hospital, and you may know you have a problem there, and you may have to go deal with it. Um, or, um, you know, you could use this to, to, to have a real-time dashboard of alerts that you're continually pinging to make sure that they're functioning. Um, and uh, certainly other high-risk industries do that all the time. We don't. So you could envision sort of a view of the future. We have a real-time monitoring system that's looking for these problems all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I would add that when I often think about David's um, the, the leapfrog test that they've developed and now they're um, improving upon, I, I sometimes think that I, I wish that even the vendors up front would use it and it would be used at configuration before you even go in production. Like you've heard David say a couple times, at least we can all agree that lethal orders shouldn't go through. And, you know, it's not too hard to think of lethal orders. And, you know, why even wait till production to, to test it? Why not just, you know, right when you configure before you go live, put in some uh, lethal off um, orders using um, their test and see what happens. The vendors should even do that. Like they, you, you see the variability that David showed with configurations. Um, some things maybe shouldn't even be configurable. Like we just don't let a, without a doubt, um, lethal dose of a narcotic to go through um, even from the get-go. Um, I think there's a lot, lot of opportunity for a lot of people to use the test that they've developed. So we are pretty much at the end. I'm going to, uh, David, we had a lot of very, fairly specific questions about the LeapFrog tool. I'm going to let you take the last question, um, which is when will the new version of the LeapFrog assessment tool be available? It will be available in LeapFrog Survey next year. Great. Thank you. So LeapFrog um, so Survey next year will be using the new tool. Super. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for all the questions to do the Q&A panel. Um, um, we are at the end of our time, so I have a few words around uh, CME and CE credits. Um, for those interested in obtaining continuing education credit for participating in this webinar, please visit the URL shown on this slide, and you'll select today's webinar, which will be indicated by date and title, and then complete a brief evaluation of the event to claim your credit. And you'll have 60 days to claim your credit for participating in this webinar. Upon exiting today's webinar, ARC is also fielding a brief evaluation, and we hope that you will complete the survey to share your feedback with us. Thank you all very much for participating in the webinar today. We hope you will join us for future learning opportunities. And again, thank you uh, to David Klassen and uh, Jason Edelman. We appreciate your time very much. Thanks, everyone.